Welcome in particular to today's speaker, artist Victor Ekpuk, whose work we celebrate today. It is our pleasure to officially mark the opening of the exhibition, Autographics, Works by Victor Ekpuk, beautifully installed in the exhibition galleries upstairs. I'd like to thank all of the staff at the museum for the thoughtfulness that they put into the myriad details of planning this exhibition and associated events, and to the faculty, educators, and students of all ages who will teach and learn in the galleries in the next four months. This exhibition was organized by the Cranert Art Museum and Kinkeed Pavilion at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, also a lender to the exhibition, and curated by Allison Purpura, that museum's senior curator and curator of African art. Please join us tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. upstairs in the galleries for a special tour of the exhibition by Allison. Other lenders include the artist, thank you, Victor, Fidelity Investments Collection, and Dennis Forbes Collection. We also thank all of our generous supporters, many of whom are here with us this evening. For this exhibition, those supporters include a grant from the Illinois Arts Council Agency, and for the Hoods presentation, the Leon C. 1927, Charles L. 1955, and Andrew J. 1984 Greenbaum Fund and the Sissy Patterson Fund. We cannot do the work that we do without their support. Victor, it has been a delight to host you at Dartmouth. I'm sorry we had a little more winter than spring uh, this past week. Thank you for the extraordinary work that you have created in the galleries over the course of this week and for all the ways that you engage with faculty, students, Hood Museum of Art members, local school children, and all of the visitors to the galleries. I know that they, as we are, richer for that experience. Special thanks are reserved for Smooth Nzewi, the Hood's curator of African art, who selected and then thoughtfully curated the presentation of autographics at the Hood and the companion exhibition that you'll also see upstairs, Ukara Ritual Cloth of the Ekpe Ek Secret Society. Smooth is teaching an African art course in the art history department this term, and I think you can all imagine how rewarding it will be for students to be studying with him this term uh, in the galleries from the works in the exhibition. For both projects, Smooth was capably assisted by Alyssa Waters, class of 2015, the Levinson curatorial intern at the Hood Museum of Art. Thank you, Alyssa. Please join us on Friday evening, May 15th, for an opening of the Ukara exhibition and a special conversation with and performance by five members of the ECPE Secret Society. It is now my great pleasure to hand it over to Smooth to introduce artist Victor Ekpuk. Please join us upstairs after the lecture for a reception in the galleries. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. Uh, I really want to start by echoing Juliet, uh, our interim director, to thank the Cranet Art Museum for affording us the opportunity of bringing this um, incredibly talented artist and his work to, to the Hood. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues at the Hood for all their support uh, and the work they put uh, into this exhibition. We often pride ourselves, in addition to several other things we do, uh, for the sense of collegiality and the sense of commitment we all bring together in supporting one another in our individual projects. So I want to thank my colleagues. And as Juliet mentioned, I want to thank um, my brilliant intern, Elisa, um, who has shown remarkable work ethic and intellect. And it's been a pure joy to work with you. I really appreciate all you did uh, in respect of this exhibition. Thank you very much. In the last uh, few days, we've had, we've had the pleasure of having Victor Ekbuk in our campus, and he has been involved in a whirlwind of activities. He gave a guest lecture in my own class, like Juliet mentioned. Um, this was followed by a steady stream of young kids and their teachers, classes in the studio art program, and music department, faculty, hood members, and the general public coming by to interact with the artist and to witness the creation of a beautiful ephemeral mural uh, that now occupies the tripartite wall of the Latrop Gallery. 
After all these activities, I'm sure that Victor is ready to get back to his easy life. <laughs> but I also know that he has thoroughly enjoyed himself uh, at Dartmouth. We really welcome our visitors very well. So Autographic presents a selection of, of mostly new works um, by the artist. All 18 works in the exhibition, uh, which include uh, the artist's whimsical collages, digital prints, and his supersized drawings communicate Mr. Ebuk's autographic practice of drawing and writing. Born in 1964, Mr. Ebuk trained at the Obafemi Awolowo University, uh, Ileife, formerly the University of Ife, in southwestern Nigeria from 1985 to 1989, where he was first exposed to the limitless possibilities of drawing. He fully, he fully developed his minimalist approach of reducing form to constituent lines, uh, during, this time, as, uh, during his time as a prominent cartoonist working for Daily Times, one of Nigeria's leading newspapers. Uh, this was in the 1990s. Uh, Mr. Ebuk is a ceaseless experimentalist of the gestural qualities and sparse formalism of lines. He considers drawing as very fundamental to his practice. He continues to explore the capacious and evo evo evocative characteristics of lines. And in his practice, he do, he, it's, his practice includes drawings, paintings, printmaking, collage, sculpture installation, and public art projects. And some of these uh, forms of uh, artistic art making are all uh, in the exhibition upstairs. Mr. Ebuk's exhibition pedigree includes uh, 15 solo exhibitions in three continents, in Europe, Africa, and the United States. He has participated in more than 20 critically acclaimed exhibitions uh, in major institutions and venues all over the world. They include Africus, the first Johannesburg Biennial in 1995, Black President, the Art and Legacy of Fela Nicola Bokuti at the New Museum of Art in New York in 2007, in 2003, sorry, inscribing meanings at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art in 2007, Beyond Boundaries, the third Guangzhou Triennial in 2009, the 11th Dakar Biennial in 2014, which I curated. <laughs> uh, Africa Now, Political Patterns at the Seoul Museum of Art in 2015. And next month, he'll be creating a joint performance, Meditations of Memories at the Havana Biennial in Cuba. This particular work will be in dialogue with Chants of Abakwa, one of the African-inspired religions in Cuba. The Abakwa are sort of a, an example of the, the society which we have upstairs, but now in, in, in Cuba. Mr. Ebuk's work uh, is in the prominent collection of leading institutions, including uh, the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, the New York Museum, the World Bank, uh, University, of Mary, University of Maryland uh, College Art Collection, and not to forget the Hood Museum. He has received several artists' awards and grants, including the UNESCO Ashbeck uh, uh, Bursary, participated in several international artist uh, residences in the country and abroad, lectured in many institutions, and has appeared in several art books, art journals, uh, and magazines. His talk today, which is in conjunction with the exhibition, explores his artistic practice, mapping influences and sources of inspirations in what he has described as excavated memories. On behalf of the Hood Museum, please join me in giving Victor Ebuk a rousing welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, I really appreciate all of you coming. And I would like to also thank everyone, uh, with Juliet and Smooth, and everyone who had participated and done their utmost best to, for me to have a successful stay at Dartmouth. I arrived here on Sunday. It was, it was about me Sunday afternoon. It was, it was sunny. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my work kept me all preoccupied, and I really enjoyed the interactions with everybody from the elementary school kids to the uh, college students that came by, and the docents and all the guests that uh, uh, came by and I interacted with. 
Um, I uh, decided to uh, just sh through this talk give um, the audience a little bit of insight into my work and how what inspires it, and that has come up a lot um, <clears throat> while I make my work. Um, basically, uh, like the title says, excavating memory, I tend to excavate, started out with excavating cultural memory, which the culture that I grew up in was much closer uh, to me, and uh, I decided to start from there. Well, that didn't just happen out of the blues. I, when I was in, uh, in art school, part of the curriculum was for us to uh, look into the uh, African aesthetics and see what, uh, and bring out uh, forms of expression there. The idea being that if, um, if Picasso's and the modernists did it, then what about us that were living right there within that culture? So um, without much further ado, I would then now start to, uh, so basically what I'm doing is uh, I started to reimagine classical African aesthetics, and I really do spend a lot of time to study um, a lot of the traditional forms, and that has been a sort of a stepping stone to what I am doing now. And through these slides, I'm going to show you just a little bit of how I reimagine these forms. Um, it doesn't mean that I stop there. I, Every form of, 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 of creation is a source of inspiration. Um, so this work is Medicine Bird. It's a digital drawing. I'm also interested in the use of technology as a tool to draw. Um, like Smooth said, and that's true, my drawing is really the basis for my work. And I love lines. I love to see all, all the things that they do. Even if I want to, I'm interested in a sculpture, I still like to explore uh, the linear aspects of it. And this is the image that um, uh, the object that triggered that. What I appreciate about this work is how the artists, the Yoruba artists here, were able to stylize um, these forms of uh, in birds. I like the notion that they could just reduce a form to its essence, and that's what really attracts, attracts me to uh, the, uh, the African traditional works that I, I work with. The, that philosophy of being able to reduce ideas and, and, uh, and forms just to their essence, it's uh, really... So this object here, as you would see, in, uh, is another aspect of the, uh, well, it's not, this object is not in the exhibition upstairs, but it's another form, another, as, another object from that culture. Uh, this is fan, and all of these forms here that you see that look like patterns are actually symbols within the Ekbe uh, society. Uh, this is sort of their ritual fan, and how they're able to reduce all of those things that are actually have meanings, the symbols that have meanings to the practitioners. And um, those are some of my triggers. Now, um, now this form here uh, is called the Child in the Wilderness. As you can see within this work, Within this work, I have, they are, I'm trying to actually, you know, that con trying to put a context of writing a story. It's called Child in the Wilderness. It's perhaps a whole lot of experiences that this, this person is going through. And a lot of these symbols, sometimes, some of them are contemporary works, like the fish bones. And so this guy must have been in a very, not in a very happy state. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, there's religion here. And so on. I did that work some time ago, and I don't quite recall what it was. But that's the the um, the object that inspired the form is the Abakwa figure from Ghana. I also again I like how they've reduced it to the essence. And in my work, 
What I don't like to do mostly is to copy what has already been done. I try to reimagine it in a different way, which is how I came up with that. And I, one could actually count how many lines that I, I do there. And here again is a composition that is inspired by a question figure from Inland Niger Delta. Even though this is a horse, but in my own interpretation, these are, you know, I guess, guard dogs at night. Um, again, this is, this is a digital drawing. Um, it's mixed media because the, uh, that up there, the color is ink. I mean, like manual ink. But then again, you see how I like to take my drawing, you know, um, uh, from a traditional, from you know, traditional material to exploit with the possibility of a, of a digital media. This again is a dream journey, and it echoes the abstract patterns that these women use hot metal as a scotch on their um, household utensil. And I would say that if this were to be stretched out onto a two-dimensional surface, it would, it would make a really beautiful abstract art, um, which um, sometimes I use that as an argument about the nature of abstraction, and when people, sometimes people don't tend to associate art that comes out of Africa with abstraction. And um, they tend to think that it comes from, you know, up north, somewhere else, because uh, uh, certain scholars have put a name to it, so they own it. But, <laughs> but the nature of what is continues to be what it is, is abstraction. People have always abstracted um, uh, forms from nature, from, from when before abstraction was given the name abstraction. Um, this, is, this work is on, is on view. It's a small piece, but I guess it looks really large here. <laughs> um, it is one of those works where I actually essentialize forms, if you look at it closely, even though they look, they are in unity, well, that's the point I was trying to make about the interdependence of the people who live in, you know, uh, pastoral uh, environments, how the, uh, the, their cows depend on them and they depend on their cows for livelihood. So the boy and the cow, but the form is actually inspired by this, um, uh, it's a bush cow from middle belt of Nigeria. And what I would want people to actually look at this is think back to how modernist it looks. So again, it brings up the question of modernism. And this, this predates it. Is it something that was really totally new? You know? Um, so this. I sometimes like to make social, well, I make social political commentaries. Uh, uh, this was me uh, responding to the programs in the, in, the, in the Niger Delta in Nigeria, where Nigeria produces, I guess, the fourth largest producer of oil. And the, the people that live in this region, where the oil is made, get nothing for it. And sometimes you have state-sponsored violence on the citizens who protest for a good life. And that's, this work was made for uh, a collection of uh, certain poets and writers got together to do a book in honor of Ken Sarawiwa, uh, um, an environmental rights uh, leader who was murdered by one of the uh, dictators in Nigeria. So it was made to as a uh, contribution to that book. It's called For Ken for Nigeria, but I decided to make it a body of work later that's called a, a wailing woman, acknowledging um, the problems that is still, still persist in that area up to today. This is another drawing that's called Prisoner of Conscience. Um, 
I made the original, the very first piece I made of this was to, uh, I had, when Nelson Mandela was still in prison, is when I had this in mind. And again, there are a lot of, in the background, are lots of narrative of, around it. And uh, if you look in here, this just shows the small window that a little ray of light is coming through, which shows hope. And up there, I guess I'm trying to say that it is just like the uh, eclipse. Um, it's a passing moment. If we, that, that too would pass. And so I try to put a little bit of hope in the midst of um, hopelessness. There's another digital work called uh, All Fingers Are Not Equal. That is actually a digital drawing. Um, my idea when I try to get into the, try to work with the computer is I, I set this challenge for myself to try to use the tool uh, so that the results become something that doesn't, it doesn't look like it came out of a machine. And um, well, I feel I've been pretty successful there. And I continue to want to challenge myself and to see you know, how far I can go with um, stretching what I can do. Now, this is one of the, um, uh, the composition series. Unfortunately, this work did not make it to the hood because the museum decided to take it back <laughs> after Cranet Art Museum. But um, uh, it is one of the, um, it started when I was in a residency in Amsterdam in 2000 and uh, to, from 2000, Eight, 2009, it started, well, 2007, because I didn't make this in Amsterdam, I made this here in, in, in the United States. I started out on a series of, of drawing where, uh, where I started devoting my work to drawing. I'm actually, I specialize in painting, or it's an American word, major in painting, <laughs> uh, in, in college. But my work has always been very graphic based and drawing was really the driving force behind my work. I, I, I used to joke that I just, you know, uh, I paint my drawings. So uh, sometimes around 2006, I decided to, I, when I had the residency in Amsterdam, I had a really fairly large studio. I decided to devote my work to mainly drawing. So for the, you know, for about seven years, I was mainly working on paper and drawing. So this is one of the, I call this a composition series because I also decided to now use, I started looking at the uh, symbols within the Egbe Society, which inspires my work in CBD. I, I wanted to now begin to look at them as objects and, I, you know, and explore the aesthetics as abstract forms rather than what they mean. And it, this produced a series of works, some which are in this exhibition upstairs. Uh, this is a detail of the composition number one. And well, I just have to stand in front of it to show scale. <laughs> uh, this is my studio in Washington, DC. And this piece you have here, this is one of the very first pieces that I made uh, when I started that idea of, of drawing at a, at a studio in uh, Amsterdam. It is not called composition because it took a little bit of struggle for me to get my head away from acknowledging the meaning of the symbols that I was using to just mainly looking at them as just abstract forms that I just wanted to enjoy the aesthetics only, So, which is why it's called sanctuary. And also because it, um, you would see some of you. Actually, this symbol. You, if you look at the cloth in the room, the blue room, I call it. With your color cloth, the blue room. You will see this symbol in some of the cloths. It means uh, uh, the lodge where the Egbe people, Egbe members meet. And the way I looked at it is also it had so many layers of other meanings that has to do with maybe levels of consciousness or. Um, it, among the Yekbe or whatever, you know, in any society that is closed, the, the more you learn, the more you learn, you go into the, into the inner, um, to the, you know, get to the core. 
And it's also a, a pyramid if one were to put in a 3D a computer, you would have a pyramid. So I thought that was, when I was you know, seeing a, you know, a symbol like that in that, I thought it was very profound. So which is why I made the work based on it. So this is a detail of that image. And this, were, this piece here, as I continue to explore forms and looking for uh, forms in different places, uh, the textile from the middle belt of Nigeria attracted my attention, how it is done. And that's, that's what sort of um, attract, you know, um, invited me to want to explore that abstraction in the textile design, this hand-woven textile, and the way that they just have simple strips. And that is another variation of the uh, sanctuary symbol, but this time I, part of what I do is I enlarge it and you know sort of re-frame uh, it. And as you can see, um, there are colors that are discovered within the work. I guess that that is the painter in me coming out, just sneaking colors in there. <laughs> Well, the, 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 whole, the whole the idea of, of my drawing was that I just felt very strong that, that drawing should be able to stand on its own and not be a support for painting. So when I use color in this sense, it's to support the drawing. But conventionally, drawings are supposed to be what you do first. You just mark areas that you, so that you paint later. Um, so in exploring drawing this way, I just wanted to give voice to the lowly drawing that <laughs> and move it a little bit more on a you know, higher pedestal as you should be able to stand on its own. So that's another composition number five. And um, that is another Composition number three. Well, that's just to show, you know, how, because people have asked how I do it, which one comes first. Well, as it shows in this work, it looks like the, the charcoal part of it, the, the darker part of it comes after I have done all the little um, drawings in the middle. But it changes. Sometimes it doesn't always follow that order. And um, now, um, this, this next set of slides I'm going to show will be about my a little bit of experience, how I have also excavated my memory of living in a different space, within a different culture, uh, this time living in the Netherlands. Um, initially, when I arrived, I was, and I started driving. It's, this the particular road sign was very confusing because it, it actually means do not enter. I was wondering what it, <laughs> what it is that, um, it, because what I would believe intuitively would be that if they said don't enter, they would put a slash around it. But then they put a circle around it, so it was very confusing to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I made this drawing called This Amsterdam Life. Um, it's, sort of, it's sort of backwards, you know, the, the writing is sort of backwards. And these particular work also speaks to a broader context of how I found the society. From the outside, um, while it's initially going to it, you, I got the impression that it was a very liberal place. Anybody could do whatever they want. You know, there's, there's, you know, there's drugs and constitution, you know, prostitution is the business, that they pay taxes, so everything is good. But <laughs> as I continue to live there a little bit longer, I just come to realize that it's actually, they have a very conservative strain as well. They have a very do not enter, <laughs> and they mean it, <laughs> you know, aspect to their life. And, and that's, that's sort of how this, 
uh, composition came in. <laughs> this sort of came about. And another aspect of it was that was very unnerving for me. As much as I enjoyed Amsterdam, um, I didn't want to be there from October to December because of this. Um, the whole country just goes crazy with these racial insults. <laughs> and um, I found that rather, you know, because every, like you see in the video upstairs, candies, everything had sweater peat on it. And um, so I, my studio was in this neighborhood where I took this picture. I was just coming out of my studio one day and I saw this mom and his children, I had children coming out to celebrate Swati Pete, so I stood there and took a photograph of it. Um, so he started me thinking about the whole notion of, um, I mean, I've always, I learned about, growing up in Nigeria, I saw we did learn about trans-Saharan and trans-Atlantic slavery. But being in this residency and, you know, being within this, you know, the culture when this thing was, have, had me focus more on it and start to do research on, uh, on a, a series of, of work that I call Slave Narratives. And uh, while I was in the studio in Amsterdam, I produced this very first uh, uh, drawing called the Slave Narratives. Now, the thing with this work is that, yes, this got, if one look closely, there are a lot of narratives within the work itself. Uh, it's one of the few works where I actually, the background is telling a lot of stories. And also, I juxtapose this, this was supposed, yeah, what, what would have been human bodies with yams. Now, yams, I'm not talking about sweet potatoes in the US. <laughs> in Nigeria, we have, they're like that big, you know, very starchy tubers. And they're the main cash crop, or food crop, cash crops in Nigeria. And the farmers have barns where they put them for the next harvest or waiting to, waiting to ship them for, to the market. Um, so, and they are usually arranged neatly in the barns like this. So I sort of juxtapose this as, you know, this, uh, this uh, the human condition in this boat that, that took human beings to be bought and sold, uh, where they became property and they became uh, object of commerce. Um, it also, I explored to find out what the involvement of the Dutch was in this trade. And I found out that, well, they're sort of the middlemen, they make the boats, and that uh, even though uh, the Netherlands did not so much have slaves on their soil, but they had plantations, sugar plantations in Suriname and the, and the Dutch Antilles and the Caribbean and so on. And um, that, that is how the, the, you know, the trade was going on. That sort of brought, brings me back to the idea of the story behind Swatter Pete, whose master is St. Nicholas. I mean, he lives to serve him. And when he comes out during Christmas, he rides in his white horse and the Swatter Pete's just run around him doing stupid and silly things. I was, you know, I started thinking, so how much more could you even though this is supposed to be very playful, or when they say we're just playing, we don't mean anything by it, but how much more do you instill this sense that of subjugating a people into a child's head? Because this is supposed to be what children play with. And that somebody that looks like this is stupid and senseless, and, and to make it even worse, he's the one who punishes children for bad behavior. So he's a boogeyman. <laughs> You know, and so you know, those so subliminal messages that, that you're giving to kids, and they grow up with that. And then people wonder, you know, when these things slip out and so what, what happens. I wasn't raised like that, but no, they were, you know. <laughs> um, but that, all those sort of things was what, what I was, you know, thinking about. And um, so this is a detail of, I had to bring it a little bit more closer. This image here is what I felt about the, that relationship, the power relationship between St. Nicholas and his, and his Black Peter. And uh, I think sometimes within this work, there's the XXX, which shows the, um, 
symbol for Amsterdam. So sometimes, to, you know, to put it in, in context and in the place where I made it. Now, this is the piece that is here. This is number two of the slave narrative. As you can see, uh, that um, the slave ship there is dotted with red. Uh, that should be symbolic with, uh, with blood. And then the human cargoes, and some of them that were sick, and some of them that were revolting, is just jumping into the dark, endless sea. And uh, within this work also mentions or touches on I guess the aftermath of slavery, you were talking about lynchings during the, you know, the Jim Crow era and so on. And uh, it's really about sort of the general human condition within um, that era. So it's an, it's an ongoing work, and I hope I keep continuing to do more research on it. What I, this, what I didn't include here are the paintings that I made after um, exhibition that was made uh, done at the Walters Museum in Baltimore about uh, Africans in, during the Renaissance period. I was re responding to the objects in that exhibition. And um, so there's more detail of that, of that work here. So perhaps, you know, now that I've brought the camera closer, maybe when you go upstairs, you can look much more closely at the work. And I must say that I, well, let's go back to, see if I can go back to that. Well, the material that I use here was actually um, a pencil eraser um, to erase, to write this story on this black. I had to erase out um, the lines that you're seeing. I don't know how many people are familiar with pencil eraser. People don't type anymore. But <laughs> Um, so after all of that, uh, this is what I felt every day that I would come into my studio um, around that period in Amsterdam. Um, I guess it was really black and blue. Um, uh, after Louis Armstrong's uh, song, as you can see, this work is really devoid of anything except the loneliness and sadness of the person. Um, so I decided to continue the composition series. In 2013, I, um, I had an opportunity to go to do an artist residency at Santa Fe Art Institute. The reason why I wanted to go there was because I was always been interested in art of, um, you know, of, uh, of Native Americans. Not just that, you know, just art that has to do with, I don't know, um, the ancient peoples. And uh, I also I saw a parallel between some of their forms and um, some of their forms and African Forms. I wanted to go and explore that. I wanted to go and do that much more closely. And so um, the very first time I, I landed in you know, the airport, I was driving, it was the landscape that struck me. How so different. And now the earth, and sometimes the sky is just, just plain blue, nothing else. And uh, all of those colors just play very well into each other. So the very first drawing I made while I was there was called Santa Fe. It's my own interpretation of my own, um, how I, I, I observe the landscape. And within the work are also uh, Native American emblems, like that's one of the, some of the masquerades uh, and so on. And the relationship that I saw within these uh, triangles, I also find in uh, the patterns that um, in African, uh, crafts and objects. So this, uh, I was also, you know, but as I go out, 
I choose whatever symbol or form that I saw around me to also express myself with it. And as I said, it's still continuing with the idea of enlarging and recomposing um, little symbols. In this case, I, was, I wanted to see what one of these dots would look like if it's that big. So I, you know, I explored that in the work. Then I visited um, an artist friend of mine who lives in Santa Fe, uh, Tom Joyce. I believe I'm told he was here some time ago. He's a blacksmith. And in his studio, he, has, he collects things that have to do with from different cultures, especially from African uh, uh, culture. He has a huge, whole range of, uh, of blacksmithing um, tools, and one of them was a bellow that I saw. And I, the form really attracted me to it. And uh, I decided to, as part of my Santa Fe uh, inspiration, I decided to make work out of that bellow. And this is, you know, I guess, you know, sometimes I, besides just exploring abstraction and stuff like that, I do make or observe or respond to social and political issues in my work. And I've always wondered about this phrase, guns do not kill people, considering the number of dead bodies um, that we find after interaction with this object. Um, so it's just, this is just me asking a question. And which is why I'm writing it backwards. Because <laughs> it's confusing to me. <laughs> um, what I also do with my work is I, uh, after being living in the United States now for about 16 years, and I'm now a US citizen, I guess. For every immigrant, it's not new that you begin to question the issues of who identity begins to come up, and you become this multi-layered of person, and and then you, you're you're imbibing your new culture, and then you're remembering your old culture, and sometimes they collide, and sometimes you make peace, and then sometimes you. So this is a, a piece I called uh, Mickey on Broadway. Um, it. It's, it also has several layers of meaning. I'm looking at what well, you can see. It, the body of these of this forms are basically Africanish, and then you have this uh, Mickey heads. Uh, these are actually they are plates that I bought from a Mickey store, in a Disney store. <laughs> so, and. Um, so it, it um, I'm talking about myself, and I'm, I'm looking at myself, I'm looking at others, I'm looking at myself as an artist, and asking those questions, it has to do with, um, you know, being, achieving fame, <laughs> and being successful at this, stage of life that we sometimes I see as entertainment. And then uh, it talks, it's an it's like existential question about when we finish playing our role and then we step away. And, um, and Mickey, being what it is, is an everlasting youth, and we always want to be that. And, um, but at some point, um, we really need to step away. Uh, this, here, when I made this work the first time was a period, I mean, it was a very clear example of what I was talking about. I lost a cousin, um, I guess, uh, you know, so I was, when I was doing that project, so I, I had to immortalize her there as well. Um, so that was, you know, Mickey on Broadway. It's a little fun work that So I'll introduce you a little bit of my paintings. Um, 
once again, we, we're talking about uh, excavating memory. This culture uh, that uses these forms were actually the, the, the stepping stone or the platform for which my ideas about essentializing forms um, came out of. And, um, and this is one of the earlier works that I made in 1993 that echoes that those influences called Paradise is Here. Uh, Um, well, at this point, I would like to thank the Hood Museum for, <laughs> for honoring me with acquiring this piece. Um, so this is uh, Three Wise Men. It's actually a diptych um, where I, uh, there's a little bit of spirituality about the work, about the omnip omnipotent and omniscience of, of the, of the, um, of God, or you know, uh, higher consciousness, if you will, and um, I was there. Are certain aspects of of religions that you know respond to this through three different colors. We talk about Trinity and so on. It's not a question that or something that I've given a definite answer to, but I have the idea to make the work, and I'm not going to say that I have it uh, absolute complete narrative about what it is, but it, um, I finished it and I liked it and it felt powerful to me and I'm still going through the emotions of exactly how it is, but it does have to do with divinity. <laughs> Um, you be me, I be you also. I did this while I was living in the Netherlands. It was triggered by um, uh, an ignorant experience or some you know, ex encounter with an ignorant person um, that has to do with race. And this sort of was my response to that. And the piece is now in the collection of the World Bank. So when they had the exhibition, I was, I was showing them. I was, you know, explaining the work to them in, during the installation. Now, once again, I'm revisiting the bull's head. And this time, um, the work is called The Hunter. The sanctified child, once again inspired by the Aquaba figure. At some point in my work, even in my painting, I decided, I guess long ago, before I started to really draw on paper, to make a conscious decision to use less color um, and to uh, challenge myself to see what the composition would look like if I don't use as much color as it should, as it suggests that I should, because it's a painting. Um, in 2013, I had a residency at Fondation Blacher um, in the south of France, uh, where I produced work for, I did, which was a large scale work that um, Smooth chose to show at the Dakar Biennale. Um, so I'll just go through the process of making that work. It's a combination of you know, three-dimensional uh, form and painting. <coughs> so that's the finished piece. It's called Totem, State of Being. I must say it was very difficult to, spend, to paint on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I realized that my knees were not as it used to be when I was 20. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Now, a channel break by Hip Sister series uh, is actually a piece that um, is an ongoing, most, one of the most recent body of work that I'm making. Um, uh, since I, I've gone back to painting, um, it is, um, yeah, it's my, an engagement with the aesthetics of, of women of African descent. Uh, this series of paintings and drawings uh, started as an exploration of the art of hairstyles and body markings, a uh, form of uh, self-expression among young women of Nigeria or Southeastern Nigeria. But eventually, it, it expanded to acknowledge similar attitudes towards body image and self-expression among young black women in the diaspora. Asiano Boyekpa is actually an Ibibio word uh, that references to proud young women or proud virgins. While the hip sister is an African-American idiom used to describe a highly fashionable woman. Uh, so my thinking that perhaps this attitude of proudly inviting a public gaze by being hip through changing one's body image with elaborate hairstyles and body adornment is no coincidence. Through genetic memory, these African cultural practices continue to find expression among women of the African diaspora. The perpetual flux of the old and the contemporary and of Africa and the diaspora and the persistence of cultural memory are you know, the main consideration for the series of works that I've done. And um, once again, what I'm doing here is actually also reducing the form to essential, essential essence. Here, we look at the hair and you know, the body. Um, what triggered, you know, when I started doing this series, this is one of the later ones that I've done. I saw an image, I was doing research, I saw, you know, looking at photographs and so on from magazines and so on. So I met, I saw this, this photograph in a, an old, um, um, out of print Nigerian magazine of this woman, this young woman with the hair like that. And uh, she really, I was really attracted to it, and I decided to use uh, to, to, for her to be an inspiration for my work. Uh, this marking on her face, actually, uh, among the BBOs, you know, sort of shows her status in life, um, whether she's a virgin or married, and something. You know, they do these hairstyles when the woman is, um, is celebrating their rite of passage, and the hairstyles actually do have names and so on. Um, in this case, this particular hairstyles, uh, because it, it is meant to mimic uh, the breast of a purposeful girl, it's called a barbaric <laughs> So, <laughs> you know, and uh, well, the story behind this thing, you know, uh, this photograph is that is always, you know, so I always tell it. I, because I also use social media and to show my work, and so, on, so I posted it on social media once and. One of my friends that I've known for quite a while, um, you know, just sort of exclaimed, I said, that's my mother. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, no, you, that's your, you can't, how, how can that be? And he said, seriously, that's my mother when she was in the Polytechnic. We have the photograph at home. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it was very, you know, it was one of those moments. So eventually she introduced, she showed the image to the mother and she said they quickly ran and took out the photograph and put, you know, rubbed it off and framed it and kept it because now it was, because <laughs> now, you know, and I didn't work on it. But I eventually met her, unfortunately she passed, um, I think last year, but um, I eventually met her and she was equally amused as well. <laughs> And uh, so these are, these are some of the more recent ones that I'm doing. This is a large, much, much larger work. Uh, I think it's 48 by 60 inches. Um, <coughs> uh, there's a famous Nigerian photographer, Okayo Jaikere, who in the 60s was, was documenting women's fashion and hairstyles in Nigeria. So, um, you know, I sort of use this photograph to illustrate how that his style would be. And, you know, uh, black women are not short of ideas of what to do with their hair. <laughs> and 
this is you know inspired by an old very old object um, you know because I used to think that when women part their hair is because of some um, that they may have had the idea from how uh, Europeans do their hair but it turns out that um, you know my great-great-grandmothers did it that way too <laughs> because this object is actually quite uh, old from Now we come to the idea of ephemeral drawing. Um, my thing of ephemeral drawing is after a while I, I had come to uh, have the notion that uh, uh, the idea of memory, the memory is what gives us our identity. And, uh, and that, that condition continues to be changed, continues to shift and be affected by circumstances. So to uh, illustrate that, I, I started a series of work, of work making ephemeral drawings that is going to be wiped off after the exhibition. Um, so it, that started with <coughs> uh, a publishing company wanted to do, um, they published African Interest um, magazine, it's called ZAM. So they invited me and other artists of African descent who were living in Amsterdam to do an exhibition in one of the galleries in Amsterdam. And um, I thought that it was a great opportunity to use the gallery space to um, express my memory of the place as I knew it. And, this, uh, and that started this work. And um, which was also wiped off. Now, the other component of this work is that it's the video aspect of it. Uh, I will show you a little bit. Um, sorry. Well, that's Amsterdam. So the combination of the sound and the visual sort of encapsulates the experience of Amsterdam itself. I did not make the work in the train station. It would seem like it, that's what it was. It was a performance, and people were watching me. So you can see that distraction right there.
Then we have the uh, Appalachian State University. I also did a performance. Um, it was nice to see those objects here again in the Hood Museum. Um, I decided to just do sort of a call and response uh, to these objects uh, for whom the symbols um, inspire my work. And that's um, why I put that there. At the Carnet Art Museum, I also did a performance. Um, when I had a solo exhibition there that was curated by Alison. I don't know if she's here yet. Uh, that is the finished work. And that is the finished work at the hood. <laughs> so the, the next video will be about the very first time that I made um, the performance in the United States. It's called Meditations on Memory. I said, I didn't do that first part. A kid came over and picked up a chalk and started drawing on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just filling it in for him. Collateral damage.
Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's um, an example of, um, of uh, what I mean by memory as an ephemeral condition. Um, that could be interpreted in all different ways. And I believe that it's just it's life itself. So maybe it's a reminder of uh, what life just wants to do. And, uh, and there are people who live in, with that condition as, as a physical condition. And there are people who live that condition as just the part of living. Um, <clears throat> So in 2014, I was invited to the uh, Arkansas Art Center as part of the National Drawing, uh, it was called National Drawing Invitational. And in addition to showing my work, uh, my other drawings, I offered to also make an ephemeral drawing, but this time I offered to engage um, uh, Beethoven's uh, Ninth Symphony, or to Joy. And I would would let you watch that video <coughs> as it was made. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we'll, we, we can take one or two questions, and then all, the rest of the questions can follow uh, the, uh, during the reception. One or two questions. The, I mean, we thought of the one time that you uh, obliterated the car. Whenever you do the uh, ephemeral pieces, are you the one who um, destroyed them? Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I mean, do you, do you take care of the piece from blank wall to blank wall? Um, no, that was the only one time that I've uh -huh. done the destruction myself. The rest, I leave it to however the host institution wants to take, but you know, the, the, the important thing is that they wipe it off at the end of the day, and they make a video of it while they're doing it, because it, it's in the wiping off that the work is complete. Uh, what type of paints or rollers or markers were you using? Uh, That's one of the new uh, stuff they've made now, acrylic markers. 
that you could, you know, just put them in a, you know, and, and squeeze and draw. Yeah. Okay, one more. <laughs> <laughs> when you begin your work, do you know how it's going to end up? Um, there are certain parts that I, I, when I sit in front of the, the surface that I'm going to work on, I do make a composition or do make a design of what, what the parameters are going to be or what I would do. But the writing part, I don't um, know what is going to be the next thing that I'm going to draw. So it would come as you are working. Right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As a stream of consciousness thing, uh, what I do so that I don't lose myself is to initially mark the boundaries where the work is going to be. If you notice, there were small dots, line, dotted lines around where I want the work to be. That is my guide because otherwise, I don't. I just go. I don't remember, and I ruin my composition. <laughs> And the works on paper, because the right there is different, but that the, the ephemeral work is more where I really tune into my stream of consciousness and just let it go. The work on paper, then the, you know, the left brain comes and I continue to question myself a lot uh, about what, whether that looks good or not. But uh, you know, on the large scale, once I leave a mark, that's it. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. <laughs>